Uh, I'm James Banks, and I'm the Killinger <laughs> Professor here in the College of Education and Director of the Center for Multicultural Education. Uh, first, our announcements. You should have picked up as you walked in uh, an announcement of our next major event, which is a conference on May 16th. Did you get that folder, that flyer? If not, get it when you leave. Uh, we're going to have a big uh, launch conference. The Senate will be launching its fourth publication consensus report. We are launching that uh, report uh, that we co-published with the Stanford Center on Adolescence. So it's going to be a big event, so please spread the word, May 16th. The keynote speakers, by the way, all uh, participants in the conference will get a free copy of our $12 new report on youth development and youth civic development in education. Again, we jointly published with Stanford Center for Adolescents. The keynote speakers will include the director of the Stanford Center for Adolescents, a very famous psychologist, William Damon. And then we'll also have Eric Blue from Citizens University here in Seattle, Lance Bennett from the Little Science and Communication, are some of the major speakers. So um, that will be Friday, um, May 16th, and, and we hope that all of you will come. The second announcement um, is um, the Center Summer Visiting Faculty, which I know that many of you wonder every summer who will it be. Uh, this summer it will be Tyrone Howard from UCLA. It, 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 he is the author of Why Race and Culture Matters in Schools, and his most recent book is Black Male, Peril and Promise in the Education of African American Male. So those are two events I wanted to announce. But first of all, I should say welcome to the 18th book talk in the Senate's multi uh, book talk series, the 18th. You can see the other 17 on the back of your program, which I hope you picked up. If not, you can pick it up uh, as you leave. Uh, this is our 18th book talk. First, acknowledgement and thanks. It takes a village to organize a successful book talk, and no one can do it alone. I would like to thank the two individuals, the research assistants in the center, who have really worked very hard on this. I'd like for them to uh, Raise your hand to be acknowledged. Tao Wang, a PhD student. Tao. And Yi Ting Chu, a PhD student. Both are research assistants in the center. I should mention about half my students for PhD are now international in multicultural education. I think that's happening in some other fields like second language learning. So it's a very exciting development, I think. The book talk series. The purpose of the book talk series is to stimulate dialogue among our faculty and graduate students within the College of Education and an interdisciplinary dialogue among colleagues across campus about ways to increase the academic achievement of all students and to help all students develop positive racial attitudes and become effective citizens of a democratic society and learn about the histories and cultures of the various racial, ethnic, cultural, and linguistic groups in the United States and around the world. Increasing our work is looking at global issues. Not only have we increased a number of international students, but my own personal work now is looking at citizenship, uh, education, and diversity around the world. Another purpose of the Book Talk series is to involve teachers and students educators and our outreach activities at the center, and we try to get school folks at each of our events. What is our procedure? Dr. Steele and Dr. Colin Vargas will together speak for about 45 to 50 minutes. We will then invite your participation in a Q and answer dialogue for about 30 minutes. After the Q&A, Dr. Steele and Colin Vargas will sign copies of their wonderful book called um, Identity Safe Classrooms, Places to Belong and Learn. Now my introduction. Uh, first, I'll introduce Dr. Dorothy Steele. Dorothy, could you, uh, they'll see you shortly. Um, first of all, to welcome her back to the university, uh, she and her uh, co-author, often co-author, Claude Steele, were here for 14 years. Uh, I knew that I, I became friends of theirs when they were here. 
before they went to Michigan, and then they went to Stanford. So we're so fortunate to welcome her back to the University of Washington. Dr. Dorothy Steele is the former executive director of the Center for Comparative Studies and Race and Ethnicity at Stanford University. She is a prominent early childhood educator and is interested in public schools, including teaching practices that are affected by diverse classroom, alternative assessment processes that inform teaching and learning, and strategies that build inclusive communities for, for learners in all schools. When I introduced the concept of identity safe schools in my seminar, my students were just fascinated. So when I edited the Encyclopedia of the University of Education, I asked Dr. Steele to do an article, and she wrote a very nice one. I met Dr. Becky Convaris uh, last night over dinner in uh, a, a wonderful new restaurant, by the way, in the U Village, called Lemus. Is that the name? Lemus. Lemus. It's very nice. Um, <laughs> once I learn its name. Um, Dr. Be Dr. Becky Convaris has worked in educational settings for more than 35 years as a teaching administrator. Uh, raise your hand, they'll see you. Uh, eventually. She is currently the director of Not In Our Schools, where she designs curriculum, serves as a school coach, and produces film and digital media on models for creating safe and inclusive schools. She also teaches online courses on bullying prevention for the University of San Diego. And she was telling me last night at dinner that a lot of college professors are involved in bullying. I said, well, that what's been happening to me. <laughs> I said, I gotta read about bullying by college professors. Anyway, it is my deep pleasure to welcome back to the University of Washington, Dr. Uh, Dorothy Steele, and to welcome to the University of Washington, Dr. Becky Convado. Thank you. Yeah, that is terrible. <laughs> I took her time. <laughs> um, thank you for coming. Even my sister is here with her husband. My daughter's best friend from high school, Lily Lu, who now works at the Gates Foundation, and dear friend Robert Radford, and many other people. And I'm so glad that you have joined us. Um, Jim, that was a, a really nice introduction for Becky and me, and we really thank you for it. It's um, a privilege and a pleasure to be at this Center for Multicultural Education, uh, led by Jim Banks. I think you all know that Professors Jim and Terry Banks are the mother and father of multicultural education in America. Through their teaching and research, writing, editing, supporting of young and growing faculty and, and scholars who grapple with these complex problems of creating an inclusive environment, they've helped to shape life in schools in probably uh, in uh, a way not matched by anybody. So it's really a pleasure to be here with Terry and Jim. So here we are. It's the year 2014. This is the year that we hope that all students would be reading at grade level and that more of our students would be graduating from high school in four years and prepare to go to college or other training. So some gains have been made. These goals, as we know, have not been achieved. And because of practices like zero tolerance policy, we are punishing rather than guiding way too many students. <coughs> this unfortunate approach to discipline has horrible effects on graduation rates and the future academic opportunities, especially for students of color. What has prevented us from reaching these goals? We propose that part of the reason is that we educators often do not think about the whole child, the whole student. Instead, when thinking about strategies and learning goals, we assume that learning is a cognitive process only and do not recognize the fundamental link between student social and cognitive development and the needs associated with that. But learning is a social process that depends on fostering positive relationships so students can trust that they are safe to fully engage in learning. We would even argue that cognitive development cannot occur unless the social nature of learning is addressed throughout each day in the classroom. A negative social environment can cause noise that distracts students from learning as they worry about their competence and their belonging in the classroom. 
we are here to introduce another way to think about teaching and learning, one that we call identity, safe, identity safety. Identity safe teaching practices are based on the results of our year-long research in 84 diverse classrooms. The goal of identity safety is te teaching is to make school a place of true inclusion by providing students with challenging, meaningful curriculum so they feel that they belong because what they know and can do is seen by the teacher and valued as the basis for further learning, no matter what their social identity. Social identities are those attributes that every one of us has, whether we are white or black, young or old, rich or poor, gay or straight, Methodist or Muslim, you get the idea. For instance, I am an older white woman who has spent her working life with children and teachers but I am also married, a mother of two, and a grandmother. These personal identities matter a lot to me, but they're not so relevant here today. The thing to keep in mind is that all of us have multiple social identities, not just one. Sometimes, though, one social identity, one of your identities, can be seen as problem problematic or restricting. Because of our racialized American history, some social identities have become linked to school success and others are not. This mismatch between social identity and school success is dramatically illustrated in a film called American Promise that was shown on PBS on uh, the, a show called POV. I don't know what it stands for, but it's a regular mm -hmm. PBS show. This American Promise is a profile of two African-American boys who were um, admitted to the Dawson School in Manhattan. The Dawson School is um, a creme de la creme private school in Manhattan, and they were trying to diversify their student body, and they admitted these two young boys. When we meet the boys, they're in second grade. They're bright-eyed, butchy-tailed, energetic, ready to laugh. We see them in the film. They're, they're tracked <laughs> everywhere, on the way to school, at school, playing on the playground, working with their teacher, and so forth and so on. And you see that they are flourishing as students. They are in good shape, and they are happy to be there. As soon as fourth grade goes, the tenor sort of starts changing. There's a lot of tension. We know that fourth grade is a big turning point for many students. You finally have to sort of be in charge of yourself, get, get your mittens and your hat, uh, take your homework, remember your library book, and all of those things. As well as academically, there's more um, independent work put on kids, including writing research papers and things that kids have not, uh, for the most part, done until that point. So for many children, fourth grade is a turning point that has some developmental challenges. But what happened to these boys in this particular setting is that those normal challenges got seen as personal problems, that, they, that it was their problem. And the parents started putting pressure on the boys. There was a lot of sort of disappointment being expressed towards the boys. One of the boys got called a liar by his teacher, which is a big name to bear. And you see this change in, in um, sort of the, de the demeanor of the boys. There's resistance about going to school and so forth. One of the most poignant scenes in this uh, show called American Promise um, occurs uh, after the boys have been to um, a dance. They're in sixth or seventh grade. So we see one of the boys in his bedroom lying on his bed looking really dejected and kind of forlorn. The parents come in the room and say, what's wrong with you? Why are you so tired all the time? What's the problem? He said, I would be better off at Dalton if I were white, wouldn't I? There was silence. They didn't answer. And I don't blame them. That's a hard question to answer to your child. He said, tell me, I would be better off if I were white, wouldn't I? Again, there was no answer. And then he revealed that he and his friend had not been able to dance with any of the girls. None of the girls had danced with them. Now, we probably everybody in this room can tell stories about bad time at a dance in our life. Dances are fraught with the occasion for social rejection. But this boy was clearly linking his negative experiences, including the dance and being called a liar and you know being seen as a problem, to his social identity. He was making that connection at really quite a young age about his, how his social identity was influencing his experience at school. This is what Becky and I are here to talk about today. We believe that identity-safe teaching can help lift this burden of social identity from, that's associated with students' uh, uh, social identity so that all children can 
become, they can attach to school openly and become successful learners. So here's what we mean by identity-safe classrooms. Identity-safe classrooms are those in which teachers strive to ensure that their students feel that their social identity is an asset rather than a barrier to success in the classroom and that they are welcomed, supported, and valued, whatever their background, whatever their social identity uh, are. Where did we get these ideas? Beginning in the year 2001, my Stanford colleagues and I conducted a study, a year-long study, of 84 first, third, and fifth grade classrooms. Researchers documented what occurred on the classroom on the observation form we designed with over 200 items, including the arrangement of students and materials, the nature of the relationships, the types of questions directed to the students, the presence or absence of cooperative learning, the level of student autonomy, and the teacher's approaches to dealing with conflicts and misbehavior. We look for evidence of the use of culturally diverse materials and activities as a resource for teaching rather than a more colorblind approach, which is common in schools. Trying to be fair, we try to be colorblind, but it's a problem. The, the classroom observations that, uh, revealed that it, um, in our sample of teachers, our, the, the, the sample of teachers uh, fell into two groups. The one group used more teacher-controlled approaches and focused on teaching <coughs> facts rather than a more constructive developmental approach to teaching. And they relied on competition more than cooperation um, to motivate their students. The second group of teachers were more child-centered, used more culturally diverse materials, and spent time focusing on creating positive relationships in the classroom, helping the kids learn to get along and solve problems together and be in charge of themselves a bit. We look for two important outcome measures linked to these different classroom practices. First, the student scores on the state mandated standardized test, and second, the student's attitudes about school measured on the student questionnaire that we designed and, and gave to them. Here's what we found. First, students in higher identity state classrooms had higher scores on the SAT-9, that's the, the state's um, uh, required test, than students in lower identity state classrooms. So they, they performed well on tests. Secondly, the student questionnaire revealed that students from higher identity state classrooms were more positive about school, including their overall, overall liking for school, their motivation to learn, their um, sense of autonomy, their interest in challenging work, and their sense of belonging in this way. So they have a um, positive affect about school and a sense of real agency and, and so forth in school. These findings are very promising for teaching in diverse classrooms. They are in stark contrast to the phrase given to schools whose curriculum is high on remediation and low on inspiration, and whose discipline is punitive and based on heavy-handed control rather than giving students trust, responsibility, and autonomy. By contrast, identity-safe teaching focuses on the experience of the classroom from the student's perspective, each of the student's perspectives. To figure out how to do this, our research asks the question, are there ways to shape classroom life that will reduce the opportunity gap for students whose social identities, their race, gender, ethnicity, etc., is too often associated with lower schooling outcomes. Our work on identity safety evolved from the body of research done by Claude Steele and his colleagues beginning in 1987. At an elite university that year, Claude discovered that the African-American students who were equally prepared for college as their white classmates had lower grade point averages than the white students. <coughs> that is, on average, white students with high scores on their entering ACT uh, test had higher grade point averages than students with low scores. It kind of makes sense, right? The same pattern held true, high scores, high grades, low scores, lower grades. The difference was that black student grades were significantly lower by a whole standard deviation than the white students with the very same ACT score. So even though they looked equally well prepared, their grades were not <coughs> good. This disturbing discovery that well prepared black students achieved lower grades than their white classmates with the same scores could not be explained by our usual 
uh, suggestions such as poor schooling or lack of interest in education. Any kid who worked hard to get into the University of Michigan cares about going to college. So Clyde and his colleagues thought someone else, uh, something else had to explain this gap in grade point average. This question led to the research on stereotype threats still going on today. Stereotype threat theory suggests that people from negatively stereotyped groups may fear in situations that are relevant to them, like college or fifth grade, that they might be judged or treated in terms of stereotype, or they, they might do something that would inadvertently confirm that stereotype. To test their theory that well-prepared but negatively stereotyped students would do less well than students whose group had no such negative stereotypes, the researchers did this initial study. College men and women math majors were brought into a lab and given the section of the GRE that's used for people wanting to go to graduate school in math. The men and women were told, this is a hard test, just try to do your best. You've all heard that phrase. In this first experiment, the skilled women performed significantly less well than the men. It could be said that when students are dealing with negative stereotypes, they have to multitask when taking a test. In addition to taking the test, these students may also be distracted with thoughts about how their performance on the test might confirm, in this case, a gender-based limitation that the stereotype alleges. To see if this worry, the stereotype threat, could be lifted from the women math majors, the researchers brought in a second group of math majors, women and math majors. They were given the same section of the GRE as the first group, but told the following. You may have heard that women score less well than men on difficult math tests, but that is not true. For this test, excuse me, the results were astounding. Just by hearing the simple sentence that unlinked the cultural stereotype about women and math performance, they performed as well as the men. Since these initial findings, based on women and men in math, numerous studies have been conducted to de demonstrate the depressed performance of people in various threatening situations. For example, black students perform less well than white students on an intelligence test when the test was described as a test of, uh, um, of ability. But when the same test was given to another group of uh, students, of black students, and they were told um, that, um, that uh, th that it was a puzzle rather than the test. And in that case, the black students performed as well as the white students. So that the relief of having to perform a test was uh, taken from them and their, their performance increased. In another set of studies, white athletes did better than their black teammates when the task was described as one based on sports intelligence. By contrast, the black students outperformed the white students when the same task was described as a test of natural athletic ability. As you can see, we are all experts on the cultural stereotypes of our group. What is important here is the stereotype threat can be imposed or lifted, depending on how tasks are represented. Literally hundreds of um, studies have demonstrated the power of stereotypes on human performance. But another body of research explores how to lift the threat from negatively stereotyped students. Our work on identity-safe teaching practices is an effort to translate these positive principles and strategies from college students to, um, to elementary students. And I'm going to look for my other page that Jim and I, I think, shared papers here, so I don't lose my... All right. <clears throat> This is what we will show you today. From our research, there is a constellation of things teachers can do to change life in the classroom so that students can do better on the standardized tests, improve their liking for school, and increase their willingness to work hard and enhance their feelings of belonging in the school. Before we address the uh, question of how to create identity-safe classrooms, we're going to uh, look at a film called uh, Blue Eyes, Brown Eyes, with Miss Jane Elliott and her sweet third grade students from Iowa in 1968. You may have seen this film, but I ask you to watch it with two ideas in mind, stereotype threats and our proposed antidote, antidote identity safety. Let's look at how Miss Elliott was able to intentionally create a temporary but powerful negative stereotype threat 
by placing collars on Jeff for students. So the brown-eyed kids one day and the blue-eyed kids the other day had collars around their neck. After the class, I'm going to ask you to talk with your neighbor for a few minutes about ways in which teachers sometimes unintentionally create a stereotype threatening situation. And then we're going to try to show you some positive ways to, to undo these things. Brown-eyed people aren't as good as blue-eyed people. That wasn't true. I lied to you yesterday. <laughs> the truth is that brown-eyed people are better than blue-eyed people. <laughs> Russell, where are your glasses? I forgot them. You forgot them, and what color are your eyes? <laughs> Susan Ginder has brown eyes. She didn't forget her glasses. Yeah. Russell Ring has blue eyes, and what about his glasses? He forgot them. He forgot them. All these brown-eyed people are listening to what we're saying. Look at Brian. Are blue-eyed people good listeners? No. Brian, will you put that down, please? Thank you. Yesterday we were visiting, and Greg said, Boy, I like to hit my little sister as hard as I can. That's fun. What does that tell you about blue-eyed people? The brown-eyed people may take off their collars, and each of you may put your collar on a blue-eyed person. of recess. You blue-eyed people are not allowed to be on the playground equipment at any time. You blue-eyed people are not to play with the brown-eyed people. Blue-eyed people go to the back, the brown-eyed people go to the front. people are better than blue-eyed people. They're smarter than blue-eyed people. And if you don't believe us, look at Brian. Do blue-eyed people know how to sit in a chair? Very sad. Very, very sad. Who can tell me what contraction should be in the first sentence? Go to the board and write it, John. Come on. Loosen up. Here we go. That's better. Let's do it again. Oh, there's nothing like a W. Thank heaven for the blessing. Here we go. Come on, let's do it again. Loosen up. Up, up, up. Come on. That's better now. Do you know how to make a W? Okay, ready for contraction for we are. Now that's beautiful writing. Is that better? Yes. Brown-eyed people learn fast, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Boy, do brown-eyed people learn fast. Very good. Greg, what did you do with that cup? Will you please go and get that cup? and put your name on it and keep it at your desk. Blue-eyed people are wasteful. Okay, want to be time this morning? Yeah. Eight. I use Orton Young and Phonics, we use the card pack. And the children, the brown-eyed children were in the whole class the first day. And it took them five and a half minutes to get through the card pack. The second day, it took them two and a half minutes. The only thing that had changed was the fact that now they were superior people. I know you're going to get faster than I ever had anyone go through the card pack. Over to the Why, why couldn't you get them yesterday? <laughs> you made a How long did it take you yesterday? 
of, that they believe that she held. And so they continue to act up. And in fact, their, uh, their behavior continued to escalate. And so and one of the ways we were, yeah, what we were talking about it is that you've got to treat them and say that, no, when you say this in class to me, that's not appropriate. You know, and to intervene and that, that kind of um, assertive behavior was um, really necessary for her because of all the social identity pieces that were going around in the class as well. Thanks. And that shows also that it's, it's unconscious. She probably didn't even think she was doing that at first. Other examples? So similar situation, um, I'm, I just came from a coaching meeting actually with a, a candidate who had a video of herself teaching and, and her um, coordinating teacher is has the first grade students split up into ability groups. So this teacher candidate didn't do this, but um, the ability grouping that I observed was that even though three quarters of her class are students of color, the students in, uh, I guess what the coordinating teacher calls the high group, um, were all white. And um, then there was one African American girl who came in later, I guess she'd been in the bathroom or something, and when she approached the table where they were sitting working in a small group, they were doing stations, um, her, her chair had been taken. And so she, this young girl was walking back and forth trying to find a place to sit at this table of the all white students, and it really struck me. Um, and, and I asked her if she had noticed that. And she is so busy thinking, like she's learning how to teach and thinking about so many other things that she hadn't noticed it. And so we talked about how, if you notice something like that, what could you do to address it? Um, so my group, we talked about uh, somewhat of a purposeful action. I'm not sure if that was the goal. But um, in terms of calling on a student and saying, um, you be the voice of the community. Um, there's one thing that I've seen a lot happen in, in my classroom is, well, you're, I don't want to say it in a way that outs people, but I'm going to out it anyway. You provide the international perspective. Tell me what that's like to where one student who might be Chilean has to represent <laughs> an Australian or a, or a Chinese perspective of what the problem, what the experience is. So I think sometimes you put a lot of weight on communities unknowingly, and that also can uh, create positions where it's like, I, if I say something that's wrong or falsified, that I'm giving you bad information, where a lot of times that's also painful for individuals. Mm -hmm. Just a quick example, going back to the uh, Fikistan, um, how we can do things, uh, perpetuate stereotypes in language uses. So in this case, Jane is doing thank heavens for the W's. What about the kids in class that don't believe in heaven? Mm -hmm. um, and that's just kind of one example. I think very often we do slip into um, cultural bias or stereotype type threat type language without being aware of it. So this is all perfect lead into where we're going in the next part of this conversation about identity safety because technically, what you're going to see in this next part in the results of our uh, our research is that all that pe none of the people, including the one who maybe said you're going to represent the international perspective, didn't intend to make anyone feel bad. But as it happens, these subtle social messages, whether they're said through language, and we'll talk about that more, or how the classroom is set up, are really important. And I, I think a lot of us are aware that just this January, Barney Duncan came out with, well, the, the Department of Justice together with the Education Department came out with new research about the over-representation of black students at, and Latino students in suspensions and expulsions, and three times to every white child. And then they looked deeper, and the kinds of things kids were sent out for were things like defiance that was unclearly defined. And so that subtle thing, like in the film, she was very clearly stating, you know, the blue-eyed students are not smart or whatever, but sending the kids out, you know, you're out of the room. Like, probably the example that you gave first about the teacher, 
this, uh, you know, I can imagine a new teacher puts up with it, lets it go, lets it go, and all of a sudden it's too far, you're out. And because it's like, can't handle it anymore. And so the extremes of, and so they're finding that a lot of the kids are suspended for defiance for very um, shaky reasons. And I'm working, um, our office where I work is in Oakland, and Oakland, California is doing a lot to try and counteract that. So just to go back to identity safety, the research on identity safety identified different, what we call factors, and we broke them into four areas, the components of identity safety. And so we're going to do what I call the seven day, seven country tour of Europe for the components, because we don't have time to go into depth. But I want you to realize that the reason we spend so much time on the research was to give you a grounding, because anyone who's working with teachers or in classrooms knows that a lot of things you're going to hear, you're going to say, oh yeah, we knew that. But it's the components all together and that really awareness of social identity that creates identity safety. And so I just want to back up a little tiny bit to tell you kind of about my research because Dorothy and I have been colleagues at the Child Development Project, which was working on creating care and community of learners. And we did workshops together, but it was a colorblind model. We're going to treat everybody the same. And it was a great model, and it's used all over the country. But the work on identity safety really attracted me because it goes a lot deeper into trying to understand how to reach all students from many different backgrounds. And so when I hadn't seen Dorothy in a while, and I ran into her, and she was beginning the research. I was a curriculum director in Palo Alto, and I was in charge of a program from stu of students from East Palo Alto, which is low income community, community, that's across the freeway. It's kind of like apartheid in, in that area because there's a freeway. It's another, it's actually another county, and so there had been a court decision that brought in five percent of the students in the Palo Alto district, which is high income area. Mm -hmm were from East Palo Alto in this voluntary desegregation program, and I was in charge of it. And the kids came in in kinder. They had to come in through a lottery system, so the parents were really involved in trying to get their students into this school district where they would do better. And just like in the movie that Dorothy was describing, the POV um, PBS series, the kids come again at kinder in the system the whole time, and yet there was still a big achievement. And so I was really interested in, well, what, what is happening? Why is this happening? And that drew me in, because Palo Alto had the resources, had the qualified teachers, a lot of things we didn't have in Oakland where I'd been previously, and yet there was this gap. So as you'll see, the, um, we're going to go through all of these, and then later you can ask questions, or you can actually add strategies that have worked for you in these areas. So the first area of chats and teaching includes four categories. And it's all about thinking from the point of view of the student. One of the teachers, in my research I worked with four teachers who wanted to unpack the research that Dorothy discovered in the 84 classrooms. And so the book is a combination of what the four teachers in this year-long teacher action research study came up with together with Dorothy's research. And Dorothy also had a study group with this community where she did her research. And one of the teachers in our book would go into the classroom and every day she, before school started, she'd sit in a different seat to try and look at the room from the point of view of that student. And it, it really, it's, it's like what, listening for the student voices, understanding what the students are feeling to connect to students. I had an experience similar to someone, what was described in the back of my stepdaughter had come to the U.S. from Nicaragua at age eight, and her teacher asked her, she was just learning English, and she got singled out, and they said, tell us about Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> well, Nicaraguan people don't celebrate Cinco de Mayo, and she didn't, she was just totally caught off guard. So again, it was a well-meaning teacher, but be aware, know where your students are coming from, know their languages, pronounce their names correctly, and so the idea of listening, being aware of each student, teaching for understanding really matches with now the swing in education to the common core. So I'm thank goodness that we're getting away from some of the rote teaching that people were doing to 
pass tests and really trying to understand and use constructivist methods. Focus on cooperation in identity safety is not just cooperative learning activities. It's using cooperative thinking, teaching students how to cooperate all day long from the beginning through the end of the day. And one example of how to do it is if you have group work happening, have the students reflect on how do they cooperate. So after they've done an activity, have, just have a two minute reflection. Are we getting along? Are we cooperating? How are we working together? And students at any grade level can give you that answer. And then the final one, classroom autonomy, is finding opportunities for students to choose and to think about what they want to learn, whether it's interest-based groups, whether it's make, helping you make a decision about the classroom. So all of these four together we've put under child-centered teaching, but it's all about students taking an active role and being engaged in their education that can start already in kindergarten. The second area is classroom relationships. And the two factors that came out in the research were we combined one into teacher warmth and availability for learning and positive student relationships. And by that we mean it doesn't, if your students go outside at recess, it does matter what happens to them there. It is part of something as a teacher that matters to you. And the availability for learning is to be able to support them along the way. I'm going to read an example from this book. In, our book is kind of organized around these sections. And so one of the teachers, Karen, created an activity called Status of the Class. So I'm just going to read you for a minute. Karen's students learned how to express their feelings and empathy for one another through an activity called Status of the Class. It can be done in less than five minutes. And this is how it goes. All the kids make a set of index cards, number one through 10. And when I say this, is quoting Karen. Okay, status of the class. They take their cards out and hold it in front of them. Anyone want to share? So they each have a number on their card, one to 10. And one student will say, oh, I'm a 10 today because I learned how to use my skateboard. The second student would raise up a two. I'm a two because my turtle so it allows everybody to share in their own way. And kids can say, can, and kids will come to say to me, can we do status of the class? I need everyone to know I'm feeling really down. This activity turned out to be really powerful. And so what she's doing by doing that is allowing the students to bring their lives into the room. It takes two seconds for them to put up their number, and she can immediately view even the ones who don't speak she can go afterwards and say, how are you doing? So the power of this um, classroom relationship with the students makes a really big difference. And I know if I asked you to think of a teacher right away that you've had over your life experience, it would probably be a teacher that cared for you. Let me ask you to do it. just quick, think for a minute and then raise your hand if you want to share about that teacher. Um, I think this so was the teacher I had in probably second grade, which is probably one of the reasons why I'm <laughs> in the program here at UW. But I was in the Bellevue public school system many years ago, and I was tracked into um, the less market group. And I mean, it was just awful. There was definitely like what we called the dumb kid, the normal kid, and then the smart kid. And I was in the dumb kid class. And um, our teacher was phenomenal because we would walk into that room and everybody felt smart, even though we were the dumb kids. And she, I mean, it was totally like the checking in. She, she cared about us and made us feel important. And I think if she hadn't been that type of person working with the dumb kids, it would have been pretty devastating. Thank you for sharing that. I think I think it's so powerful the impact of teacher. I mean that's why so many of us went into education, the power a teacher can have. The the book we put some books I actually got this idea from you, Dr. Banks, when you did a keynote. We put some books that you might like in so this book, The Bus Kids, um, is a book about the voluntary DSEG program that I was describing for me from East Palo Alto. 
and I wrote that now Professor at Stanford, and he actually saw by observing these students, even in the playground at age five, coming in from East Palo Alto, they felt different. They were isolated in some way. And he also noticed just simple things teachers did that counteracted that. And one was reading the bus. So after his book got written, I had him come to speak in Palo Alto, and now all the teachers are greeting the bus, then it makes a difference. You come an hour to come across the freeway, and you come into this other world, and you, you're you feeling out of it, and having a friendly face smiling to greet you when you get off the bus makes a big difference. Another kindergarten teacher actually arranged playdates, because she noticed that the kids from East Palo Alto weren't being invited to birthday parties. And so she kind of did her own little matchmaking and hooked people up because she knew that that was going to make a difference for kids. So classroom relationships and teacher work are really important. Cultivating diversity as a resource. This is what I feel has really made a difference in an identity-safe classroom, is that that diversity as a resource, again, is all day long. It's not what people come to call the tourist curriculum, you know, we're going to celebrate Martin Luther King Day. I'd have parents come and explain to me in Palo Alto that every year their kids were asked to write about the I Have a Dream speech. You know, and they never even learned about um, Harlem Renaissance and you know, some of the poetry. And so it's bringing that diversity in. And teachers will often say, I don't know, I have kids from all these countries. How can I do it? I want to be fair. If you have the kids' voices, the kids will bring them to themselves so you don't have to worry about it. And this is also true as diversity, family diversity. In my job, I've been making a film on family diversity. You have kids coming to school who have gay parents. You have kids coming to school who are adopted. I just recently talked to someone whose grandson had to write about, brought him a book about um, every child has a mother, and his mother had abandoned them. And she said that it was just heartbreaking because it showed little animals with their babies, and it said, your mother, they love their babies like your mother loves you. So just being aware of all those things. And you're still going to make mistakes, but the more you look at your class and your students, you won't. Along with cultivating diversity as a resource, we also have the high expectations of academic rigor. A lot of the, the work that has broken kids into ability groups has really dumbed down the curriculum. And there actually are states in this country that have lower um, standards for black and Latino students than for white and Asian students. I was kind of shocked to read about it. And how many of you had read any of those articles about it's Virginia and Florida and the proficiency levels? Because there was very little about it. And I, I tried to research it more. There were some articles at the time in 2012, but it's you know, it's holding them to different academic expectations. It's actually frightening. And the idea of a challenging curriculum for everyone, the idea of we're not going to have differentiated learning where one group is memorizing and doing rote learning and the other is doing the higher level thinking because students can have higher level curriculum at all levels. And I know with the Common Core now that what's coming in is a lot of group work. Teachers don't always know how to do that group. We were speaking in Oakland, a teacher, a high school teacher raised her hand and she said the group work doesn't work because some kids do all the work and and it was clear they hadn't taught the students how to do that group work and they hadn't thought about how do you create group work that's meaningful. So the combination of the, the cooperation throughout the day together with challenging curriculum makes a big difference. And there's a wonderful book, Finding Joy in Teaching Students of Diverse Backgrounds by Sonia Nieto, I don't know if you've read her work. She has very similar philosophies to the identity safety work. The fourth and final category we call caring classrooms, caring classroom environments. That's the whole environment you set up, the unspoken part of the environment. And the first one in that area is called teacher skill. And teacher skill is actually we, we, we grappled with what to call it. It's how you kind of manage your home room and, and the environment so it's actually smooth, so that you aren't spending a lot of time correcting and disciplining students, but that there's a sense that students want to participate and want to be connected. It's also the emotional and physical comfort walking into a room. And you, you can feel that even when you walk into a 
grocery store. Some places you can't find anyone to help you, and other places people will walk you to where you're going. Well, that's true in the classroom, and those of us who've been in lots of classrooms, you can walk in one room and walk next door to the next room, and you can feel the difference. And this is at all socioeconomic levels. It's creating an environment where everybody feels welcome and everybody feels connected. And in the area, in that area, I'm going to read something also. Well, wait, I'll go to the last one and then I'll come back to it. Um, attention to pro social development matches with what is now called SEL, social emotional learning. But again, we take it farther than just social teaching, social emotional skills. Say, pay attention to the development of your students all day long again. Not only teaching them social skills, but where are they at developmentally? What kinds of things are on their minds? so that you can create an environment that meets them where they're at. And there's another really great book called Learning to Trust, Transforming Difficult Elementary Classrooms Through Developmental Discipline by Marilyn Watson that we'd recommend that goes through how do you set up a classroom using developmental discipline is, a, is about learning how to, or teach, using the discipline model to teach rather than to punish. And again, that's the whole, the models of restorative justice and things that create that warm environment so kids don't feel like they failed when they've made a mistake but that they learn from their mistakes. So the last thing we want to share, which is part of the <coughs> caring classroom environment, fits in with what was said about language. It's the power of language. And so we know that on one hand, as you heard all of this, you might think, well, this is overwhelming to do all these. But on the other hand, where do you start? And this is one good place to start. Think about your language that you use. I was in a classroom last week, a high school biology classroom, and it had a sign up on the wall that said, time is passing, will you? And that's not a very positive <laughs> <laughs> And I had seen it once before in a special ed classroom. So the other thing about positive presuppositions is this is a little gift you can take home when you're working with your children or your significant other. It's the idea that how you phrase things makes a difference. So the negative example, you better study for this test or you will fail. You may not feel like you're giving a negative message, but you're kind of making, putting out the idea that you might fail this test. While the positive example, and, and that the person may not study, as a pos the positive example is when you study for this test, what will you work on first? It's assuming you're going to study. So I'll just read a tiny bit for my book, putting back here. And one other thing we always forget to tell you, especially those who are working with teacher candidates, we've designed in the book little sections to do activities. So at the end of each chapter, there's an activity page. And on our website, um, which is identitysafeclassrooms.org, you can download power PDFs of these activities. So one of them is an activity with positive presuppositions. So um, this is fun. If we have more time, I'll have you think of some positive presuppositions. So a presupposition is an assumption that is hidden in phrases we use to speak to one another. For example, in the phrase, even Pablo would understand this lesson, the word even implies that Pablo is not smart and that the lesson is easy. While the words don't directly state that, this message will settle into Pablo's mind. These negative messages will accumulate over the course of many school years, and Pablo will form a view of himself, as did those students that were described in the dumb class, as not too bright. Negative attitudes about school and disruptive behaviors are sure to result in the process. So positive presuppositions can take you into a whole new world as you watch what comes out of your mouth. It could be true at home too. When will you ever get that back room cleaned up? <laughs> so now I'm going to do this thing. We are ready to take some questions and answers. So Dorothy and I will both do that. Still their own questions. I'll just make sure they stop at the right time. <laughs> we have a question right there. We'll pass this back. Hey, um, thank you uh, for this presentation and talk. Uh, so I'm coaching in special ed. And so my question is pretty direct around inclusive means students with disabilities. So how is this impacting the inclusion of students with disabilities being in schools or 
So, yeah, one of the things about identity safety is all identities, and I didn't, we didn't go into all the identities, but in the book we, we do have some things specifically mentioning special students and special needs. And I think the way it impacts students, and I'll talk some personal experience, because I have a son that qualifies both as gifted and a special ed, and he struggled all the way through school, so that will be. My next book was I write with him. He is now a nurse, but I watched the impact of he made to feel dumb. And he was identified in fifth grade and he cried. So I think part of it is, his sixth grade teacher, I remember she said, I have a bar that's very high. And little Johnny, not my son, he raised the bar. You said that at graduation. He jumped over the bar. And I thought, yeah, and you didn't scaffold it for my son. You know, he'd be home every night struggling to do the math problems. So I think all these strategies work very well for special ed. I, I think you were asking more than I can answer, which is, uh, um, what are, is it affecting policies having to do with inclusion? And I don't know. We, we just are presenting these ideas to begin with. Certainly the ideas match with that. Um, but, uh, and, and I guess your question also had to do with, do we really mean inclusion into the regular classroom? Well, I was just curious if, you know, if you're collecting any specific data on students with disabilities yeah. and how their identity may be influenced in, in the classrooms. Yeah, but it's a huge question, and, and, and we are trying to think very broadly and inclusively when we think about what we're doing. My own guess, just from what I've read that you and Claude have written about stereotypes, but I would think that special ed kids would be especially vulnerable yeah, yeah. to a stereotype threat. Yeah. Um, um, and uh, I would think it would be a powerful factor. That's my guess. So I, I just wanted to Excuse me, can you hear in the back? I just want to know no. if we need to use a mic. We don't. Um, you Gary, you said you could hear or you could? Mic is better. Uh, could you stand in? Right. I just wanted to thank you for um, actually focusing your work in the way that you have. Because very often, my area is teaching, um, preparing teachers, but particularly to work with English language learners. And um, one of the things that has just come out in my class that um, I really have been emphasizing is the fact that we can't just focus on particular groups. So when you have a pull-out program and it's totally focused on working with English language learners and they go back into the same environment, that it's much larger than that. And that you know, one of my students, when we were talking about bilingual education, said, well, if everything you say is true, then that means we really have to teach everybody about the benefits yeah. of bilingual education and language learning. And I would say to what Doug um, commented about special ed, it's the same thing. We cannot keep pulling kids out, helping them deal with these issues, and then sending them right back into the same classrooms with the same social problems. But it's much broader than that. And I think that your work, focusing on this is what good teaching looks like, and it is inclusive, and it does recognize um, the vulnerability of our students and helping other <coughs> students reach out, invite the students who are English language learners who are struggling with that curriculum to actually, um, you know, be a, be a mentor of them and and then learn what they also have to offer. And that that that's you know the significance of your work for me. So thank you so much. Yeah, it goes both ways. On that note, did you find anything that was especially useful for what I would say is an in invisible identity? So I'm thinking of undocumented students mm -hmm. or migrant farmer students, because you talked about social identities at the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this was a large descriptive study, and we were trying to find out if there was any relationship be what, between what teachers did on a regular basis in the classroom and outcomes for students. But the principles apply no matter what the identities of students are. So the, the idea is that the classroom, it's not like we have to go around if we go pointing out various identities to kids. It's that in our learning, in our learning environment, that um, people's ideas are welcome, that we seek out people who are not talking, <coughs> that we seek out representation from parents who are not seen there. I mean, none of these ideas are new. What I think is really about our work is that we're applying these ideas 
in places where instead people want to have rigid discipline and uh, rigid, you know, sort of fact-finding <coughs> kind of education, and where we deny the importance of who we are and what we know and so forth. And so, it, it, at one level, it does not matter what it is about your identity, it matters that there's a place for it in the room, that we're seeking curriculum, pictures, activities, it, relationships that we focus on relationships. If you have a class, I think Robert was a principal, Robert Baffert, our friend, was a principal in a school that had both very high achieving quote unquote kids and less achieving kids. And and you know, and by separating kids in this situation, how do you help them deal with each other on the playground in the lunchroom or wherever they are together so that 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 name is not, you know, the Scarlet A isn't on your shirt, you know, that you are valuable here. You know things that other people don't know. And that we look for <coughs> ways to bring that out. So unseen identities, your legal status or whatever, is one of the important things that we're all dealing with in schools that we have to, um, you know, pay attention to. And but it's it's not that we have to go. It's like learning 22 languages in, in San Fran. Some of our kindergarten classes have 22 languages in it. There, there's no way you can learn that. But there's many ways like word walls and talking to each other and so forth, that we can make those uh, languages valued and present in the classroom. And, th and I want to add also that for students, it's the student brings forward, and it, it's creating a space where the student can bring something forward. So you may not, you may be aware as the teacher of the student's backgrounds and the student's different situations of these invisible things, and you create a safe um, Thing. And an example is I once was at a school with a panel of students at high school who were sharing with elementary teachers what it was like being LGBT students growing up to make awareness for the elementary teachers. And one of the students there had been a student at that school. And she said one of the teachers said something. She was in fifth grade and she was already starting to wonder about her gender identity. And she, the teacher just made some very simple comment that made that showed that it was okay and there were a lot of different people with a lot of different social backgrounds <laughs> and different partners and she she just simply brought in some kids have gay parents and just that little comment just stuck with that student so that she felt validated and that's the kind of thing that you can communicate to the class without singling someone out another thing is kids who speak two languages you can talk about they do translation for their parents at the doctor's office in, which is really higher level thinking. So it's highlighting different things along the way. And what I call mixing up the pot. So you're bringing out all these different qualities that make people special just in the part of the day so that they're not sort of seen so rigidly broken up. There was a hand over. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just wanted to add does your, does, your, does your work in this book also talk about reaching out to parents or applying this approach to parent engagement? Because it seems really rich, really ripe for, yeah, you mentioned a second ago, talking to families in this book, that, that all of the families in our classrooms are bringing with them this, this wealth. Um, we did not. We were in the classroom. I couldn't agree with you more. We, we, we point to it in the book, um, the importance of bringing parents literally into the classroom and being very thoughtful so we're not just bringing the usual suspects, so, so to speak, and that there are many different ways for parents to participate. And especially parents who are new to our country, um, not speaking English as their first language, parents who are in stressful family situations, we want them to know that what they do and know for their child is really important. Um, we, uh, in the child development program, I worked in a school district where they would have the PTA meetings during the day when the working class families were working and the rich mommies got to come to PTA. It's an obvious mistake now that you look back on it and so forth. There are little things like that. But I, I want to be clear in our answers here that we're not just talking about being nice, being, you know, Sunday school nice, although I'm all for that. Um, we're really talking about the link between um, cognitive and social development, that, that we're talking about challenging curriculum, challenging experiences with parents, not just making nice of them, patting their heads, really using what people know and can do to bring it into the classroom to support the learning that we're trying to promote. 
And, and so this isn't just about niceness and even just about caring, though those are sort of fundamental. It really is appreciating the link between what you think children can do and what they do do, and recognizing the, the possibility for them to really become leaders in the community and take their parents along with them as the parents are, are you know, starting farther back. So we don't talk a lot about parent ed, but I came out of Head Start, I'm definitely for it, and, and it shouldn't just be unique um, at night. <laughs> I just wanted to add that, you know, we, we sort of see this as the beginning of research, and we need more reads, and we want to inspire maybe some of you. Yeah. To, there needs to be research on this in the middle and the high schools, because our work is done with the elementary, but the concept applies. Needs to be worked on on parent on on working with parents. So hopefully it will inspire people. Let's see there. Wait. So I, that speaks to a little bit of one of my questions. I'm, I'm curious about how you deal with identity conflict because we can't assume, for instance, that uh, in any given classroom, uh, everyone's identities sort of jive with each other. Just just think of a couple of examples might be to say, what if you have do have some students who are from um, uh, LGBTQT identified families? You also might have some students that are uh, particular strands of religions that are very homophobic, and right, how do you, and <coughs> at some point in there, there's going to be some identity, identity conflict, um, which, which then also spins to another thing I was thinking about, what about identity support? I mean, what does it mean to give a positive, say, ethnic identity for kids of color, and when that might come at the cost of uh, some of the white students uh, feeling threatened, and I would say correctly so, but feeling threatened based on that. So there, there are some things about identity conflict I'd love to hear how you respond to that. I'm going to answer an LGBT topic because I was just at a Catholic high school last week and it seemed like we talked about that a lot because they had kids that would call out things in class that would offend other students. They'd even have a hate crime against one of their, their athletic director, um, an anti-gay hate crime. And so what we were talking about was how do you have those kind of conversations with students so that there is respect and you recognize that everybody needs to feel safe in school and you set those boundaries. And it doesn't mean that it's always an easy thing, but learning how to talk respectfully, learning how to recognize like the comment that's so gay, that that hurts kids, and um, opening up the conversation and having those dialogues. So rather than shying away from the dialogues, it's having those dialogues. And sometimes there'll be conflicts like a special needs student, let's say an autistic student, and in the book we have an example of a second grader with the autistic student yells out to an English learner, you're so dumb, you don't know anything. But, but the, the student who did it, did it because of a lack of social awareness and how do you manage it? And actually in the book we have a whole section after each chapter called Challenges and Dilemmas because it's not, there's not one right answer to all this. It's complicated. So Ed, I'm, I'm responding in general to the idea that um, somebody's gain is another person's loss. We've talked about that so much in civil rights and in education, and it's sort of like, you know, if we bring, you know, if we bring children who are less well achieving into the classroom, the other kids are gonna lose out instead of like gain. And I, I think it's so important that, um, that the way that we treat the classroom, it's a little microcosm of the world. It depends on the, ne the developmental stages of children. Um, when you've got uh, people who are, you know, homophobic um, in the same classroom with kids who are from gay families, um, you can have a challenge. It's probably worse in middle school than in the early in the early childhood. But by our behavior every day, we're showing that it's fine that you are here. We, you are included. We can't, you know, change people's views on these things. What we can do is try to assure every kid every day that you belong here, that you're valued, that we care about what you're doing, and that promoting or, or helping kids learn about some other cultural group is not denying your own background. And and I think if we look at it as everybody's game rather than who, get, who wins here, um, it, it really can help. It should be an integrated part of our daily life. Yes. I'm a tutor at a middle school here in Seattle, and this middle school has four academic tracks. And as you can imagine, the highest two tracks have almost no children of color in them. I love the work that you're doing, and my question is, are you talking about an approach that would allow a school district 
to embrace what you're talking about, because this almost sounds like this is the kind of work that an individual enlightened teacher could do, but that an entire school or an entire school district would have a lot of issues dealing with, particularly because, for instance, in the Seattle Public Schools, there's been a de-emphasis on what we used to call cultural competence training. So I'm really curious about how you think this could work beyond an individual teacher getting it and trying to apply it in their classroom. Well, or one of them. We don't know all the answers. <laughs> you know, our, our, our question, our original research question was try to, trying to explain this gap in performance between able kids and to look at this social part of learning. And I couldn't agree more that it can't, that teachers need to be in environments where this is promoted and they're not working against nature. You know, you know so if you've got a track system, it's really, you've got a bigger job than if you have a school that is not so sharply tracked. And, um, but we haven't done any work at the, at the district level. Um, Becky certainly has it in her, in her profession. But the, but the principles are exactly the same. Why are we doing that? We need to ask ourselves all the time, what is the benefit to having kids so sharply tracked? There are things that people need to learn to catch up with, but that's different than being sort of assigned to the apples and the oranges and the fruits. It's, it's very important. But I would still like to argue, I think the teachers, with, even within those tracks, could do, make a big difference on kids' life, as the young woman uh, described it in her experience. So I wouldn't give up, but it should be at the district level or at the school level. So I think also another way to look at it is our material is to use right directly in the classroom and to create what we call identity-safe school environment. So maybe it could start bubbling up from that level that, that as teachers explore it, explore these issues, they begin to ask the questions on a school-wide level to create that identity-safe climate that immediately applies in the face of systemic things. And I saw this just recently in Palo Alto District where they were trying to detract a ninth grade English class at a high school. And there all these people in the community came forward and had all these reasons why not to do it. And all these white people in the community. And I just felt like this really isn't about learning. It's about people maintaining a social order that has been around for a long time. And so we have to recognize as we're doing this that we are taking on a challenging system that's pretty entrenched, but it, it can be done. And the, I think the, the important part is to show this like, stereotype that is real. And hopefully one day there'll be enough research on identity safety beyond ours too. Like the stereotype that you can't argue with that. So therefore, there's something wrong here that all these people are doing worse in an environment that has these stereotypes. As, as one of the articles Dr. Steele wrote was, um, stereotype threat is in the air. It's, we're swimming in that water. So it's a big challenge. <coughs> anyway. We'll take one more question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, one of the things that that occurs to me is we often see the elephant in the room, which is the aspect of fear associated with stereotypes. You know, we all know that African American males are the scary people in our society according to stereotypes. Um, and sometimes we see that expressed even, even in primary grades uh, where there is a fear of the other. Uh, in working with students, I found myself talking about a situation that helped me tune into this when my daughter was 12 and she was taking three buses uh, from North Seattle, transferring downtown to, uh, to take, to go uh, windsurfing down in uh, Mount Anchor. And yeah, this is a big thing. We're asking her the, how, how it's going, you know, because she's sitting on the corner of 23rd and Jackson. And she was saying, she started telling us how it was really scary going through the International District. And it's such a relief when she got up to Jackson. And we thought, well, wow, that's interesting. Um, so she said, well, so what was the deal? And she said, well, people were so quiet getting on in the International District. Now, this is a girl who spent her first nine years in the Central District, 
as an African-American godfather. And um, she was used to a more outgoing uh, way of interacting. And she talked about what a relief it was to have people get on the bus and strike up conversations. And at that time, she had really didn't know anyone uh, that was Asian American. And just the lack of familiarity with the interaction pattern made her scared. So I think it's really important when you talk about cultural training that we recognize that we all have these automatic reactions to be a little bit scared of what is unfamiliar. And um, I think that really has a lot to do with some aspects of what you're talking about here. Definitely. I mean, that's a testimony to integrated schooling. <laughs> and when we did live here in our children were public school, and we lived in the South End, and they went to the North End school and so forth, I could see that the world's, um, uh, my daughter met Miss Lily Lu sitting there next to you from the North End, that, that friendships across locations, geography, and communities make us uh, powerful people instead of frightful people. And um, classrooms, classrooms can be many versions of that, and schools should be even larger versions of that. Sorry, but we're going to have to stop now. We'd like to thank you for coming. We'd like to do the eat it. Please eat up the food that we bought before you leave. And we'd like to, uh, let's give them a round of applause. And They will be signing, and we'd like you to come back on May 16th to the Walker Ames Room in Cane Hall for our big conference on civic education. Thank you for coming.